Welcome to Record, Mix and Release, a YouTube series which takes you through the process of recording a song from beginning to end in your home studio and releasing it to the world. And in this episode, we'll be focusing on the details of the mix. Hi folks, I'm Mike and I hope you're well. And welcome to the 12th episode of this series where we record, mix and release a song to the world from a home studio. And in this episode, we're gonna be focusing on the details of the mix. Those parts which really can make a difference if you focus in on them and they add some character to this particular song. So stick around for all of that. Now, if you wanna be notified about other episodes in this series or indeed other episodes on this channel, all about home recording, DAWs, gear reviews, plug-in reviews, that kind of thing, then please do subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you are notified about the other episodes. Now let's get stuck into some details. Okay, so I'd just like to take a moment to talk about the format of this episode so you guys can understand why I've done it in this particular way. Now, first of all, I'll be concentrating on the most important parts of this process, the most important details. If I actually covered all of the details of this mix and all the little bits of EQ and compressing, etc., that I do to it, um, it's gonna take like 30 episodes to do that. And it probably wouldn't be the most useful thing to you because what we're trying to establish here is more about approaches and attitudes attitudes and ways of problem solving within the mix. So I'm focused on a few specific parts which are important to this mix where I think you'll get the most learning from. Now the other thing is, and this has been the most difficult decision in terms of how am I going to do this episode, I've decided that I'm going to work on each uh, instrument part and then I'm going to show you afterwards how I did that. Now there's a couple of reasons why I'm doing that. I'm sure in some ways you'd like me to work through the process and like to see me work through the process. Um, there's a little bit of a problem with that. Technically, um, I like to mix and do this on speakers. That's the ideal way to do it. And um, if I use the speakers, of course, the sound's gonna come through the microphone. And if I wanna talk at the same time, it's not going to be technically very very feasible for me so that's the first reason and the second reason and probably the most important thing is although I have kind of specific routines that I'll generally go through so for example there's certain things that I'll often do to a kick drum or a snare or or what have you that doesn't mean I'm always going to do them so a big part of the process is a little bit of experimentation well experimentation with an intention I should say so I'm thinking about what do I need from this instrument in this song and then I go about trying to achieve that and to be quite honest with you that can be a laborious process at times and I don't want to um, really expose that to you guys but rest assured that if I have gone down certain routes and decided not to do them and then gone back and tried to make different I'll let you know about those because that can be significant sometimes to understand what I've tried what didn't work and what I actually decided to go ahead and do so that's my uh, explanation of how we're doing things in this particular episode and the first instrument that I will be looking at is the acoustic guitar because the acoustic guitar actually carries the song for the first couple of verses it's the main instrument so I'd like to sort of nail down a particular sound with that to begin with. So I'm going to go ahead and work on that and I'll see you at the other end. So it's actually been overnight, but I did about 20 minutes work on this guitar before I went to bed last night. And I thought I'd show you guys what I did because it's most likely what I'll keep for the final song. Um, I may do some little tweaks here and there as I introduce more instruments, but this will be the chain that I'll most likely use at the end. And I've started off with an actual EQ plugin right at the beginning over here on the guitar channel as an effects insert. And I'll just pull that up and switch it on. So I'm using uh, the Pro Q3 EQ from Fab Filter, but it reminds me to let you guys know that during this whole process, although you'll see me use specific plugins and some of them are commercial, don't feel that you need to rush out and buy these commercial plugins in order to actually finish mixing your song. You don't at all. You can most likely do it with the plugins which came with your DAW and you can get the same results. Often with with commercial plugins it's just the case that they're uh, a little bit nicer to use in some ways they'll have a nice workflow and they may have some specific features which enable you to do things a little bit quicker for example uh, but most of the time you can achieve what you want to achieve with 
either the ones which come with your DAW or the enormous amount of free uh, plugins which are out there on the internet. And I've made a number of videos about those, so check those out. But don't feel that you have to get these exact plugins at all. So the type of EQing that I've done mostly here is what you would call subtractive EQing. Or I start by listening to the sound and I think about what I don't like in the sound, what I'd like to either get rid of or reduce. Um, and the first kind of thing that I've got rid of is the very low end. Now, in actual fact, some of this I can't actually hear, and it's actually um, outside of the scope of human hearing. But it's nonetheless in the actual signal um, and will contribute later on to the plugins further on down the chain. So I like to get rid of that. And then I've also got a point where I'm getting rid of some very, very low end rumble. Now, this can kind of depend on... Um, what kind of speakers you're using, what kind of headphones you're using, etc., as to whether you'll even hear this or not. I've cut it off at a point where I could just about hear um, some low-end rumble down there. And there's a really neat feature in this particular plugin where you can look at a particular frequency, and if you see here on this node, there's a little headphone symbol. That's a solo symbol, and that enables me to listen to a particular frequency. So if I play the actual guitar track, and then I'll solo this particular node, And the question is, can you actually hear anything down there? I'll just drag it up a bit. Okay, you can certainly hear those. But right down there, I think when I was listening through my speakers, I could just about hear something. Um, I often use a, a subwoofer as well in combination with my main speakers, just to double check the very, very low end. So that's a little tidy up and a clean up of that end. The next thing I tend to go for is are those parts that I can actually hear that I want to get rid of. So let's have a listen to some of the frequencies that I've got rid of here. I'll play the guitar and have a listen to this one. You can hear right away there, there's a ring there. Now I could quite possibly be a little bit more aggressive than this. It's on a very, very sort of narrow band here. So the Q, which um, determines the width of the area that you're adjusting, um, is, is very, very small. So it's a little notch which is created there. So I'm focusing in on there. So it's not affecting too much of the rest of the sound of the guitar. I could be more aggressive, but I've obviously decided with my speakers at the time that this was aggressive enough. Um, and just as a by the way, you don't really want to be looking at numbers here. I know some of you are going to say, you know, what's, what sort of values, how many decibels should I reduce certain frequencies? First of all, it depends on the instrument, the recording, so I can't tell you specific numbers. And really, as much as you think is necessary to do the job, but you will find, of course, the more and more aggressive you are, the more likely you are uh, to affect frequencies outside of that specific frequency you're trying to reduce. So... You've just got to use your ears, I'm afraid, with this one. Moving on to the next little notch here. Let's have a listen. So that's what I would call the sort of very cheap uh, area of the guitar where things can sound a bit nasty. I could potentially use a little wider cue there, but I've just decided to use that one. So I've reduced that one. Going down a little bit further, we've got the sort of low mids here. Let's have a listen. You can see one in particular. So that creates this sort of sound is the best I can describe it. So I'm just reducing that um, reasonably significantly there just to keep it under control. Then we move down to the lower end of things. Now have a listen to this because this is quite interesting. So you could hear on a couple of chords there, right at the beginning, it was really quite boomy in that area, and then it was less as I moved on to different chords on the guitar. So remember to listen to a, a decent length of passage when you're doing EQing of particular instruments, because uh, for a guitar like this, where it's playing several different chords, um, different chords are going to accentuate different frequencies that you may want to tame. Now. You could move on here by looking at frequencies that you want to accentuate using the EQ. Um, and I've kind of done that, but not completely here. There was one particular frequency that you can see I've accentuated uh, reasonably boldly there. And this is in the sort of high mids, I guess you would describe it. And I've added this one in here. Have a listen to it. 
It doesn't sound that great all by itself, but what that's adding there is a nice bit of presence to the guitar, particularly where I do some little sort of hammer-ons and things on the G, uh, D and A strings. That really helps to bring out a little bit of crispness to that. I found that when I had this switched off, have a listen. The guitar was just lacking a little bit of presence for me. Um, hard to describe, perhaps presence isn't exactly the right word, but have a listen now. Okay, it's kind of subtle, but it's just going to help to keep it up front. Now, there are some other frequencies that I would like to emphasize in this. I think it's lacking a little bit of body. Perhaps I've gone a little overboard on particular frequencies here, and it could do with a nice top end. And you could go ahead and perhaps put a high shelf on here and accentuate some frequencies in the middle to low end. But instead, what I actually do is use a saturation plugin to do that. This is a, a tape a saturation plugin and it's called Magnetic Tour. I quite often use this particular plugin because I find it adds things in a very, very natural way, as long as you don't go overboard with it. I almost always use this A80 setting. Um, I gather that that would be a famous reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape, but I don't know much about reel-to-reel -reel tapes at all, so um, I, you don't take my word on that, go and Google it. Um, and what I've really mostly concentrated on here is adding a little bit of uh, low ends with this body setting here there's some different settings warm lush body and I've just added a little bit in there and I've added some focus by putting some top end here I could have used brilliance and I did try out the brilliance setting but it was just a little bit harsh so I went for the focus setting in the end I've just added a little bit there and some saturation as well now you do have to be careful sometimes with these plugins because they can add a bit of volume to um to the actual signal which kind of makes them just sound better just because they're louder so i've accounted for that by doing a 4 db reduction here on the output control but i'll just switch the plug-in off for a moment and then i'll play the track and then i'll switch it on let's switch it on Okay, and that really does add something very, very nice to my ears at least. It's a bit more than subtle, I would say, but just very natural sounding. So that's the next thing I do. Now, with this particular guitar, um, you can kind of hear that I'm plucking the strings and then I'm doing this slap in between, this percussive slap. And I very definitely wanted it to be there, but it can get a little out of control at times. And it can make the dynamic range of the guitar, um, the difference between the quiet parts and the loudest peaks, uh, really very, very big. So naturally, I want to sort of control that. Now, there's some different ways you could actually do it. You could potentially use a little bit of EQ to tame it a little bit if there were particular frequencies. But of course, then you run the risk of kind of destroying the frequencies um, of the guitar in a way that you don't want for when the slap isn't there. Um, another way would be to use dynamic EQ. So to use uh, pick specific frequencies where a lot of that slap is and then dynamically reduce those frequencies. That's a, a nice way of doing it. And I did try that, but I couldn't quite get the results that I wanted. So in the end... I went for this plugin, which is a multi-band compressor. And I'm just using one band here. Now, what is a multi-band compressor? Well, normally with a compressor, we're looking at reducing uh, certain um, volumes over a certain threshold. Um, but with this, we can do the same thing, but we can do it within a specific range of frequencies. So I picked that specific range of frequencies here um, where the slap mostly is. Now, there is some bottom to middle to bottom end to this slap as well um, but to me the most striking part is that very percussive bit kind of um, in the kind of frequencies where a lot of a snare would be for example um, in you know those mid highs um, to the high end of things and I've basically looked at that kind of frequency and then um, I've set a threshold for, so that every time it goes over a certain point it pushes it down and it's quite aggressive it's actually going down by about nine decibels there the best way is for me to play the track and you'll see what it's doing within this particular frequency range. Have a listen. And so you can see that it really hammers down on those slaps there in that particular frequency range. I'll just solo that frequency range so you can hear where I've targeted.
I could potentially go a little bit wider, perhaps here. So what it's doing is it's got a very, very fast attack. So it's grabbing um, that as soon as it, that transient goes over the threshold, it's grabbing it as quickly as possible. It's slamming down on it with a fairly sort of high ratio, and then it's releasing fairly quickly as well. So as soon as that is done, it releases to let us hear the rest of the guitar again. So let's have a listen to it with it off and then on. All right, I need to unsolo it. Let's try again. So the slap is still there. I want it to be there. It's kind of a part of the song and creates some percussion there, but it's just a little bit more in control. So the next thing I wanted to do was to take this guitar and kind of put it in a space because it's sounding very, very dry. It was reasonably closely mic'd and you don't get an awful lot of the room when you do that. So um, I just want to add a little bit of space to it. Now I used to always grab a reverb here, but um, in recent times, I'm much more likely to go for a delay first off and we'll discuss why in a moment but the actual delay that I've sent the guitar through to here on this bus is the Sonatus um, delay which actually comes with Cakewalk. The reason I've used this is because it's, it's fairly simple and easy for me to use, um, does the job very very quickly and I can move on to the next thing. So my approach here is to use what you would call a slapback delay. So the idea of a slapback delay is you just get uh, one repeat very, very quickly, bang. Um, so often, of course, a delay might have many, many repeats over a long period of time. With this, it's just right back at you with one repeat. And I do that for the left and the right speaker with slightly different values. And they're fairly, as I say, fairly quick slapbacks. So um, the effect then is that you create a little bit of space without losing the presence of the guitar because if you just use reverb, um, what can happen is it can push the instrument back. It can, it can make it sound not just like it's in a space, but it's further away as well. And I didn't really want to do that because I want this instrument to be right up front. So now that I've put that delay on there, I'll just actually start off with it off, have a listen to the guitar, and then I'll switch it on. With it on. Okay, so it's fairly, fairly subtle, but it's just creating um, a little bit of space around that guitar. So from there, I actually do use a reverb, but I use it very, very gently. And the reverb I've used is one of my favorites of all time. Um, but of course, as I say, you don't have to use this one. Um, but this is the Lexicon Reverb, it's called Concert Hall. Now, I'm not an expert on these um, reverb plugins at all because I have to say I just choose one of the particular reverbs I've got, you know, whether it's a concert hall or a large hall or a small room, I chuck it on there and I just usually use the send control to blend it in. Occasionally I may use these uh, controls here to tweak things, but honestly I just usually just drop it in and they often sound great, good to go. So let's have a listen to this reverb and with the amount that I'm sending to it at the moment. Actually listening now, it's a little bit too much perhaps. I'll just bring it down a bit. So I'm getting some nice space there, but the guitar is still up front. It hasn't pushed it um, away at all, hardly at all, anyway. Now the other thing I always do, or often do, I should say, um, just before it hits the reverb, in the effects chain over here, I've also, um, used an EQ in there, again the fab filter, and basically I've just done a very, very major low cut there. In fact, I'm just cutting from the mids downwards, so that only the top end of the guitar is actually hitting that reverb. That stops it getting really sort of muddy, because there'll be quite a few instruments in this mix where I'll have some reverb on them, and um, if you send the whole signal to the reverb all the time, it starts to get a, a sort of a build-up of muddiness in the middle, and you can't kind of quite hear where it's coming from. So this is a, a very, very simple thing to do, which does actually improve your mixes somewhat. Now you may be thinking, um, why have I actually sent these um, to buses rather than put um, the delay and the reverb in the effects chain? So 
first of all, I wanted to have the delay, but I didn't want to send the delayed signal um, through to the reverb. I just, I tried that and it wasn't something I liked the sound of. So it's, it's kind of going off onto its own uh, signal, having that delay, and then the, the reverb is handled separately. So that's why um, I've sent it to a bus there rather than have it in the effects chain. Um, and for the reverb, similar idea, but of course I did want to put that EQ filter in there just before the actual reverb plugin. So um, that was a, just a hand, it's a handy way of doing it, having it go through to a bus there. And I really like the feeling with these types of effects of having them set up on, on full in the actual uh, effect itself. So if we if we go across, for example, um, here to the delay plugin, if we look at the mix, it's on 100%, so it's just pumping out the delay signal there. And then blending it with the send controls on my DAW, I just find that a much more sort of organic way to work than using the mix control in the plugins. Um, you've got to find your own way, of course, but that's just the way I feel happy with it. Now, the next Next thing I'm going to be doing is moving on to the cajon because at the beginning of the song the guitar and the cajon work quite closely together. So a lot of what I'm looking to do with the cajon is separate the two microphones from each other. There was a bass mic and a front mic for the snare sound, but there's a lot of crossover with those. So I'm looking to reduce it as much as possible so that I can treat these as two separate channels and add different effects to them. Now starting off with the kick side of things, let's just have a listen to that microphone by itself. So we're getting that nice thud, but we're also getting a lot of the snare sound from the front. So the first thing I started off with um, was this plugin, which is a stock plugin, which comes with Cakewalk, and it's a percussion strip. And I really like the expander in this. Now, I'll switch that on first of all. So what does an expander do? Well, it's almost like the opposite to a compressor. With a compressor, you're looking at setting a particular threshold in volume and then reducing anything which goes over that threshold. With an expander, you're looking at a threshold, but you're getting rid of anything which is below that threshold. So you're just keeping everything above the particular threshold. So it's like the inverse of a compressor. And that's really useful because those snare hits are a fair amount quieter than my bass thud. So I should be able to get rid Rid of some of the uh, sort of more subtle hits which are in there. Let's have a listen. Okay, so we've still got the snare hits in there, but there's some little bits that go on which are now being reduced significantly. Next, I'll move on to uh, the shaper. So I like this part of the plugin. This is where you can really change the envelope of the actual sound. Um, so what I've done here is just increase the attack a little bit so we get a nice hard hit, but I've reduced the decay and the weight. So you can see the curve at the tail end has gone down. So we're not getting any sort of boomy ring to this at all. It's just a nice short thud. So with those two combined, I get to this stage. So we've still got some snare hits happening in there, but the, the bass thud is coming through just a little bit more prominently. Now moving on to the next plugin, I've used some fairly drastic EQ. So this one will get out of the way first. It's just a normal low cut, which I do. It gets rid of frequencies we can't hear, not useful to us. So I've cut those off very, very sharply. And I've done a significant cut at the top end of things here with a slower curve, so it's natural. But this just gets rid of all of the stuff which is at the top of the middle and the very, very high frequencies especially, which are actually associated more with the snare. Then I've accentuated a couple of frequencies which I do want for this particular instrument. So the first one here, let's have a listen. That's just that low end of the thud. And then this one here, which is actually important, We still want a little bit of a tap with that thud. So now I've applied the EQ in the chain. Let's have a listen to that by itself. So we're still getting some of that snare in there, but most of this is all about the bass thud. And that's what I wanted for this particular part of this instrument. So it sounds really, really strange at the moment. I know not that great sounding, but when it's blended in with the front end, you can get some really nice results. So let's have a listen to the front end of things now. Now, there's a lot of that 
tap from the actual bass hits because we're actually hitting the instrument on the front and that's where the microphones are. So what I've actually done here is something a little bit clever and I've actually used side chain compression. So I'll bring up my compressor here which is a FabFilter C2 compressor. And rather than using it in the regular way where I'm just cutting anything which goes above a certain threshold, I'm actually using the bass hits as the trigger. So what happens is, is every time the bass end, which was fairly prominent now you remember, we've got it to a stage where it's mostly the bass which is peaking, every time that peaks through it engages the compressor and on those bass hits we then compress the front end of the sound. I don't know if I can explain that much better than that. You may need to rewind and watch the last 10 seconds again. So it's easier to see um, than it is to talk about. So if I now play this again, so this is the compressor which is on the front end of things, on the snare if you like. And you can see that now that every time the bass hits, it's getting severely reduced. I'll just mute the bass. So again, we're still getting the kind of tap of that bass sound, but we're losing, you know, the, the sort of real impact of it. So that helps to sort of separate things a little bit. And then the last thing I've done is add an EQ to the snare, and I've just got one band in there, just drop that in. It was a particular frequency, which I wanted to emphasize right up here. just to give that uh, sort of snare sound a little bit of snap. So the two together now sound like this. Not loads different considering the amount of processing I've done, but I do have a bit more separation there. And that enables me to do something that I want to do now, which is to add reverb to mostly the snare and not the bass end of things. There'll be a little bit on the bass, but not much. So I've gone through to uh, my Lexicon Hall reverb here, just on a default setting. And I'm sending from the uh, the snare hits here um, from on the cajon, sending a little bit of signal through, sounds like this now. So it's mostly coming from that snare sound. There's still a little bit of it reacting to the bass end of things. I don't want that. So of course, I've done what I normally do and I've put an EQ in there and I'm cutting an awful lot there. Actually, I'll move that up a little bit. Switch that on, have a listen, see how it sounds now. Let's even try moving that up a bit. Okay, so that's the kind of sound that I wanted, and then this, let's just throw on that guitar that I'd already worked on and see how we're sounding now. Okay, we're getting there, but of course what it needs is a little bit of bass guitar. So if you remember for the bass guitar, I had two separate channels, one for the DI bass, which is this one all the way over on the left there. And then next to it, uh, it goes through to an amp simulator. And I just like to have them on two separate channels so I can blend those two signals together. And it's also quite handy um, sometimes to have that DI bass just separated by itself so you can use it for different things. And I'm pretty happy with the sound I've got at the moment. I just use one of the, almost the default settings on this, I adjusted it slightly and I may change it a little bit later, who knows, but I'm happy with the basic sound. I won't know whether I need to change it until I bring some other instruments in later. But one of the things I knew that I wanted to do was kind of duck it, to dip the sound down with it every time I get a bass hit on the cajon, so that we get the nice impact of the thud of the hit, um, then with the tail of the bass guitar, so that the bass guitar isn't masking that thud. And I've used, again, the Fab filter to come compressor for that. So if I just uh, appropriately solo things here so you can see it, and I'll bring up over here on the uh, bass guitar channel or the, or the bus over there, I've put it in there so that the whole signal of the bass, including the amp sound, is being affected, and I've put in this compressor here. Now, 
as I say, this is in sidechain mode, so it's getting its signal from an external signal, which happens to be the uh, base hit of the cajon, which we can see over here on the cajon, there's this send here, and that is the send which sends its signal to this compressor, and it uses that signal, the thud of the bass, to dip or duck the sound of, sorry, the thud of the cajon, the bass end of the cajon, it uses that signal to duck the sound of the bass guitar. Got it right eventually. Now I've also used this adjustment down the bottom here so that it's only listening for a particular frequency. It's only listening for that thud to do its ducking. So it's easier to see what it's doing if I actually play the song, which I will do now. And you'll see that every time that uh, cajon hits, that bass is being ducked. <laughs> So that's the main thing that I wanted to do with that bass guitar at the moment. So, so far I do have my bass guitar sound and I have my cajon sound, so I'll put those two together. Let's have a listen. And then that's it, add in that guitar as well. So I've got a nice little rhythm section going on there at the beginning of the song, and now I'm going to work on the big one, the main vocals. So I put a lot of focus on the vocal because it's probably the most important part of the song, but I won't be able to go into a lot of detail on everything here, and in any case, you shouldn't copy me exactly. I should just hopefully inspire you to think about things in a particular way, and then you can choose the methodology to approach those things as you wish. But I'm gonna give you a good overview of the whole signal chain here. It's reasonably complex compared to other things, so I'll go through it fairly swiftly. So I start off by tidying things things up. Before I get into compression EQ, I want to get rid of anything that I don't want to be there. And there's a few different phases to that. In fact, the first phase happens before you even get to add any plugins. And that's where you actually edit the original audio signal. So um, it's a good idea just to chop out um, any sort of long, big areas where the singer isn't singing, where they might be shuffling around and shuffling papers and things like that, or coughing, that type of thing. So I just cut out all of those things to begin with. The next phase is I use a gate to get rid of little things which are there um, in the middle of the performance, um, but I de don't necessarily want them there. They could be little breaths or things like that. So I, I use this free gate for that. I like this one. It's just really quick and easy to use. Mostly I just use the threshold control here. And essentially anything below a certain uh, signal level, it's just gonna cut it out. So let's see what it's doing at the moment. He had no shoes, he had no style. Gates closed. I had the blues, he wore a smile. Still picking up a little bit of something there. I didn't hear it, so that's fine. I asked him how this came to be. So you can see that as soon as I've stopped singing, it sort of naturally just closes down so that we're not getting any sound in those gaps in between the phrases. The next uh, little bit of tidying up I do is of course with the bottom end. You may have noticed the theme here. I often do this with many, many things. Cutting out all of the unwanted signal down there below, uh, minus 20, the stuff we can't really hear anyway, but which is in the signal chain. And then um, getting rid of some of the mud down the bottom end as well. I could possibly be a little bit more aggressive and push it up there, but listening through my speakers and also checking with the subwoofer, I settled on this particular point. Next, I move on to a de to get rid of some of the sibilants because these can be even emphasized um, when they get through to a compressor a little bit later on. So what you want to do with a de is find the offending uh, things. You could use multiple de of course, but find the offending uh, frequency ranges and then uh, attenuate them or reduce them by using the threshold. So for me, with my particular voice, I was looking for those sounds which can be pretty irritating when they're cutting through and I particularly found them annoying in this very high um, area up here and then have a look and see what it's actually doing when I play. He had no shoes, he had no style. So you can see with shoes and style it's doing quite a, an amount of attenuation there. 
He had no shoes, he had no style. And once you find that kind of frequency and the particular passages you want to, um, or the particular passages where there's offending things happening, um, then just be careful with the threshold. Um, if you go too hard on the threshold, then you can end up cutting out things you don't want too little and you don't even capture the things you do want. So it's just a matter of listening and finding that balance there. So now that I've done my sort of tidying up there with the DSA, with the uh, EQ here for the low end and with the gate to get rid of any unwanted sounds, I'm ready to move on to sort of processing the sound itself um, to start to sculpt the sound. Now there's a couple of choices here. I could go on to an EQ next or I could go on to a compressor next. Um, the order here is sort of up to you. You're going to have to try different things out and see what you like. Um, the only thing I would say is if you decide to use an EQ now, um, I would actually set up your compressors further down the uh, down the line, have them with their basic settings, and then EQ into the compressors, just to make sure you're aware of what the compressors are actually going to do. Of course, this is more significant if you use analog model uh, compressors as well. Um, but let's move on, and I'll, I've actually decided to go with compressors first. I've used two compressors. So the first one here actually is just controlling the sound a little bit. I'll go on to the chorus section where things are a bit louder. It's usually best to set up your compression on the louder parts, and we'll have a listen and we'll see what it's doing here. I don't buy what I've been sold. The happiness is better gold. Or another one can fill your soul. No, I don't buy what I been. Now you can't hear a significant amount there, but it is um, taking care of uh, controlling the vocal somewhat, just so that we're narrowing the dynamic range, so we can push the lower parts up a bit later, should we want to. Now a note here. Compression isn't my sort of first go-to tool for controlling the level of the the vocal within the mix. So later on when we introduce everything and we're listening to our mix overall, we're going to be kind of listening for parts where the vocal gets lost. Um, the first thing you should reach for is automation for that. So we've already set the basic level of our vocal in the chorus, but later on when we listen to the whole song, there may be parts where it's too loud or too quiet. Use automation for that. If it's for like a whole chorus or a whole verse or even a phrase, I would prefer to use automation. Compression is more useful when there's just very short instances of things poking their head up above a certain threshold and you just want it tame them. So that's what I'm doing here with this. And then I like to use another compression uh, for some serial compression. And this one is set to a different threshold, a bit of a harder knee, and it just clamps down on the very high bit. So it's just getting rid of the true peaks in this. Um, so let's have a look and see what that's doing on the chorus. I don't buy what I've been sold. The happiness is made of gold. So I'm using um, on both of these the same ratio, Oops, slightly different to what I expected there. Usually it's going to be a four to one ratio or so, not quite as aggressive as I had it there. Oh well, I must have thought it sounded good at the time. Um, then an attack, um, a fairly quick attack on there, and you're going to have to adjust the release depending on the particular song. So you're going to need to listen to the vocal and just play around with the release to see where that feels right for your particular song. So it's compression there, and then I move on to EQ. And with the EQ, oh, I did a lot here. Look at that. It looks like a nice kind of weird alien sea creature going on there. So uh, two approaches here. Obviously, I like to start off with my subtractive EQ. So I was listening out for particular parts of the signal um, where I want to kind of get rid of things. I don't That's that kind of radio frequency. Yuck. And then down here. Slightly more kind of nasally end of things there. And again, here this will be that sort of boomy. Well, not, not quite boomy, but that sort of yucky, muddy, muffled sound there. Um, then I've actually done a low shelf, just to create a little bit more space for things down the bottom end. And again, just cutting out the unwanted area there. And then I've gone for some additive stuff. So I've just boosted some frequencies here to add a little bit of body, again, to the bottom end, and then a little bit of breathiness and sparkle at the top end here. But I'll be doing more of that again 
with my next plugin, and you may have guessed already, which is Magnet 2. So any, uh, it doesn't have to be this plugin, as I say, it could be any kind of uh, tape emulator or saturation plugins, that kind of thing. Um, just to add a little bit of something in a much more natural way, I feel. So here again, I've added a little bit of the low sort of body to it using this lush setting. I've got a little bit more of the airiness using this high focus here, and then some tape saturation as well. Now let's see how that all sounds together. So without all of those plugins there, which we all use fairly subtly, it sounds like this. I don't buy what... In fact, let's go to a different section here. He had no shoes, he had no style. Now with all those plugins in. He had no shoes, he had no style. So you start to see it sounds a lot more sort of lush, lush, warm and present. So I'm really liking what's happening there. It's a big improvement over the raw kind of sound. Now the next thing I want to do is actually put this vocal in a little bit of space because it's kind of uh, sounding a little bit sort of close and in your ear at the moment. Now, just a mention of that. I have actually um, done some songs in the past where I've added uh, virtually no delay or reverb or anything to put them in space because it can be an effect you want sometimes, a very sort of close mic technique. But I didn't want that on this occasion, so I've actually created a little bit of space for it. And like I did with the other instruments, I've gone for delay first. Um, delay, as I say, adds a little bit of space to the whole sound but keeps the signal nice and present. It doesn't feel like it's being pushed away from you. So I'm going through to my sonatus delay here, which I'll just switch on. Again, I've got um, the left and channel set up slightly differently with a very, or a fairly short delay, and I've got no feedback on there. So I'm just getting one repeat from the whole thing. So let's have a listen to see how that sounds. He had no shoes, he had no style. I had the blues, he wore a smile. Okay, so we've just got a little bit of space happening there, but it's still a very nice present sound to it. The next thing I do is send my vocal through to a reverb. So I'm putting it in oh, just a, a nicer sort of larger space than I've got it at the moment. But again, I do this fairly subtly. Um, let's have a listen to see. I'm going through to this concert hall reverb here by Lexicon. Um, just so a point on that. If I'm doing sort of like ballads and things, I tend to use more like the hall reverb or a a random hall reverb, but I kind of like this concert hall reverb. It's a little bit more controlled, um, but not quite as controlled as I want it. Let's have a listen first off to see how it sounds. He had no shoes, he had no style. I had the blues, he wore a smile. So a nice sound, but uh, probably a little bit too spacious for this song. And the way I've tamed it is in my usual way. I've got this EQ plug in there. I've done a very, very aggressive sort of cut to cut out all of the mid to low stuff. There's no muddiness in there at all. And that reverb is gonna be focused on the higher end, the breathy end of things and the more sort of present parts of my vocals. So let's have a listen now that I've applied this EQ to it. He had no shoes, he had no style. So I'm in a nice space, but it's not kind of going on forever. So that's really helpful. Let's just see how that sounds in the chorus as well. I don't buy what I've been sold. The happiness is made of gold. Okay, so far, so good. Pretty happy with that. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is a little bit of parallel compression. This is a really common practice, and it's something which I feel is quite easy for beginners to do, but is very, very effective in terms of keeping the vocal present. And it's uh, the simple thing, as I say, I send the full signal, so I'm going, oh, this is set to unity gain, or I send it through to this channel here, where I have a compressor. I happen to be using this CLA-76, but you could use just about any compressor for this. It just adds a little bit of character, I feel. And then I am compressing the heck out of it. So let me just get rid of the reverb and delay for a moment. And let's get rid of the original vocal and have a listen just to the compressor all by itself. I don't buy what I've been sold. The happiness is made of gold. You can see it's absolutely crushing the vocal there. It's on a, a very high ratio. I mean, it's 
got a fairly a very very quick attack and it's just slamming down on that vocal and it's just going to totally flatten that vocal out doesn't sound very nice at all completely by itself but you will find that if you put it what i do is start off with it right down on zero and then i'll put my main vocal in and then I just blend this one in with it. Let's have a listen and see. I don't buy what I've been sold. The happiness is made of gold. Or another one can. And that just really helps to keep the vocal present, I find, even before I do any kind of automation and things. So it's, uh, it sort of makes it a little bit thicker as well. So a very, very common technique to use. Some people would also use a limiter here or maybe even multiple compressors even some saturation, go for your life here. But in terms of compressor, you want to be thinking very, very aggressive to the point where it sounds pretty awful. You can even, like I say, add a little bit of distortion in there as well. It can sound quite good on particular songs. Now, the other thing I tend to do after I've added uh, whatever I'm going to do in this channel, compression, limiter, what have you, I also like to put a de in there because there's often certain frequencies that get emphasized by these compressors and I just want to control them a bit as well. So I've got my de in the chain there. I've got my reverb and delay set up and I've done all of these things here. So let's see how my vocal is sounding now. He had no shoes, he had no style. I had the blues, he wore a smile. Okay, this is how it sounded originally without all of that stuff on there. He had no shoes, he had no style. So as you can hear, it's really, really come to life a lot there. So that is our vocal. And let's see how it sounds with some other instruments as well. He had no shoes, he had no style I had the blues, he wore a smile Okay, so far so good with that. Now the balance isn't particularly good. Now I want you to remember that we did our static mix at the end of the song on the loudest part of the song. But when I want to hear um, how the sound of something is, I'll often go to different parts of the songs. But you kind of want to avoid uh, the temptation at the moment to kind of mix, uh, to mess with that mix because that mix is not going to be correct in other parts of the songs. We've kind of got a baseline with our mix at the moment, but it will be with automation much later where we'll actually control the mix in different parts of the song. So kind of avoid the temptation at the moment to kind of remix when you're listening to different parts of the song. So I want to take a very quick look at what I've done with the additional guitars because it's quite a common practice when I'm at this stage of mixing because I actually want to create quite a bit of width to these guitars. They come in as secondary guitars only on the chorus sections and I've recorded two tracks playing exactly the same thing. So let's have a listen to the first one. It just is in the chorus like this. Now it's playing exactly the same chords as the main guitar, but it's being strummed rather than picked in this case. And then I've got another guitar which I recorded, which is exactly the same. Probably sounds exactly the same, but it's important that it's two different performances because they're gonna be ever so slightly different. And it's that difference that you want. You can't achieve it with delay and that kind of stuff. Don't try, just do it, record both tracks separately. Now, what I do is I take those two recordings and I pan one very, very hard to the left and one very, very hard to the right. Now let's have a listen and see how they sound now. Okay, starts to sound really nice, nice and separate and wide. Sounds like we're in a room now. Now the other thing I do is I EQ these guitars and I particularly take done a low cut on them because I don't want too much of their bottom end. There's gonna be a lot of other instruments in that space. Um, but I've also made sure that if I just look at the EQ here, look at the curve and then look at the other one, they're EQ'd quite differently. In fact, where I've emphasized certain frequencies in one, I've actually reduced them in the other. And that really helps, I find, to actually add to the width of the sound. So have a listen again. Now 
Okay, so far so good. And you could end there. But the next thing I like to do is set up two separate reverb uh, buses down here. And you'll see them here. I've got one guitar two reverb left and guitar two reverb right. And that gives a hint as of what I'm about to do. The only thing that I'm doing, which you may not expect, is the guitar which is panned all the way to the left, I send it to the right hand reverb. So, this, the main signal for that guitar is coming from the left, but the reverb is coming from the right and vice versa with the other guitar. And I find this really, really helps to make a nice, pleasant and wide sound. So now I've done that, have a listen. Okay, so now let's see how it sounds blended in with the main guitar. Have a listen to this on the chorus. So that can really help to add some sort of largeness to those particular sections in the song. So moving on to the drums, it's not quite as elaborate as you often see in these kinds of videos. Um, often people will have quite complex sort of chains going on for drums, um, especially for sort of music where drums is much more important than this sort of your EDM dance music, some of your heavy metal music and stuff. The drums are a little bit more subtle in this and a little bit more dynamic. We don't necessarily want them to be punching away all the time in this kind of music. So um, I haven't used like loads and loads of compression on the drums or anything like that. And also I'm using the plugins which are in the plugin, if that makes any sense. So I'm using Addictive Drums too, and that has some built-in functions for modeling your drum sounds. And I sort of find that they're tailored to the task, so I tend to use those ones. But of course, I'm going out to separate channels, so I could use external plugins if I wish in this effects chain. So feel free if you wanna do it in that particular way and you've got some favorite plugins. Let's go into uh, the plugin itself and start off with the kick drum. Now a little note with the kick drum, um, if you remember earlier with the cajon, I used the bass end of the cajon to duck the sound of the bass guitar and under normal circumstances I would use the kick drum channel on my mixer here to do that task. But the cajon is playing all the way through the song and the bass of that cajon is in unison with the kick bass on this drum kit so I don't need to sort of duplicate that there and do it again. But if I didn't have the cajon in the song which often and I don't, then I'll definitely be using that methodology on the kick drum here. On this occasion, I'm just concentrating on modeling the kick drum itself. So looking at it here, and when I was listening to it by itself, and I'll solo it here, I kind of felt as if it was had a little bit too much sort of ring to it. So I've attempted to control that. First of all, I love this um, control here where you can actually shape with the, you know, the general sort of attack, decay, sustain, release controls that you would have um, with this envelope to sort of shorten the sound of this drum. So I think it actually started out down here somewhere. Listen to it. And I've tightened it up like this. So it keeps to just that really short thud that I want. Um, I've also done a similar thing down here by bringing the decay down on, on these sort of shape controls down here. And also I've sent it through this iron transformer on the uh, compressor and dis distortion channel down there. So let's have a listen to all of those things switched on. So it's a pretty hard hitting kick drum there and I really wanted that especially for the choruses. So I'll probably have to adjust uh, the levels of it a little bit later when I do my automation and stuff but I'm liking the sound of that so far. Now I moved on from there to the snare drum. A similar thing again, I just wanted to make sure that it was a nice short snappy sounding snare. <laughs> It's got a little bit of a ring to it, so I'll just bring that back a bit, actually. 
Okay, and the other thing that I did on that snare was I actually used a Fab Filter um, EQ on it here. Um, I just found this EQ a little bit easier to use than the EQ, which is in Addictive Drums, and I can just sort of pinpoint what I want a bit easier. And here I'm just adding a little bit of that sort of high end snap to the snare. So that is how I adjusted the sound of the snare there. Now, moving back into Addictive Drums, the next thing I took a look at was the Tom Tom. I did concentrate on these a little bit and I'm afraid to say it's the same thing again. What I did was I actually just used this volume envelope to keep the sound of these toms really, really short. So if I go ahead and actually play this tom, oh, sorry, I have to make sure I've got it switched on, of course. Um, you can hear it's a pretty short sound without that envelope on there. It really does sort of ring on where it's short with that one. And that's the sort of sound I wanted for this. So the, the drums sound nice and reasonably sort of precise. Did the usual shaping as I would normally do. Now the other thing you will notice is it's panned really, really hard uh, to the left. It's sort of a little bit unnatural because of course if you were away from a drummer by a few meters or something as you normally would be, there's no way that a drum's gonna sound like it's completely coming from your left ear. But this is audio production and we can break the rules. It doesn't always have to sound exactly um, as it does in real life. However, the one thing I would note is I did take a listen to the overheads before I did my panning, and I just made sure that they were in line in terms of is the panning from a drummer's perspective or an audience perspective? And this is from a drummer's perspective in actual fact. And when I listen to the fills on the, if I can just find a fill for a moment while I move to a section, um, with the overheads uh, switched on, I'll just find that one moment. Let's have a listen. I could hear that the panning was going from left to right. So when I set up my uh, Tom Toms, I made sure that the panning was sort of following that, otherwise that would seem a little strange to me. But essentially, with all of those different Tom Toms, I took the same approach. I used the volume envelope and I cut them really short and I just made sure that they, they kept that sort of punch to them because it's a nice short sound. They weren't sort of ringing all over the place because with those envelopes switched off, and I'll just solo all the Toms for you so you can hear them One moment I'll switch those envelopes off on each time we get quite a bit of ring to it so let's have a listen to the drum fill okay so boom 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 it's got a little bit of a ring going on there whereas if we switch those envelopes back on try and work as quick as I can for you here guys have a listen now Okay, it's just sort of really dead, and I just really do like that sound. Uh, you may hate it, uh, that's up to you. But let's have a listen to see it. it sounds a little bit more in context with the whole kit. So it just sounds nice and controlled when I've got those drum feels. Have a listen here. And that's about all the processing I did on the drums. I wish I could give you a really long section on all the fancy things I did. And there's lots of other fancy things that you could do. But, you know, sometimes you don't have to do anything at all. It could just sound okay or right right from the beginning. So use your ears and don't think you have to always put loads and loads of plugins on everything. So hopefully the examples I've given you so far just give you an idea about how to approach different elements of the mix. Now I've been working on the rest of the mix and sometimes late in the day new ideas come up and I want to demonstrate what happened um, while you were away in this song. So I'm working on the middle section of the song. Um, you may or may not be familiar. There's a middle section where there's just a female vocal and the idea is it sounds really, really dreamy with a kind of an organ and bass guitar. So let's just have a listen to that. I've already uh, sort of treated the female vocal and chucked loads and loads of reverb on it. So let's have a listen.
Okay, so that's a basic overview of that particular section. As we go into the last chorus, sounds nice and dreamy, and I thought to myself, I can hear even more dreaminess in there, so I went ahead and created this part using an electric guitar. So the first thing I'll do is just unmute that electric guitar, and I'm just going to solo it, and I'm going to solo it down here as well, because it goes down through to a bus. Okay, so let's have a listen to what I've got. Just some arpeggios, right? Well, that's just the beginning. So the first thing I did was throw on an amp sim. I'm using this one here um, from Overloud, and it's a really nice little amp sim. comes free with Cakewalk. Let's have a listen to this. Just adds a little bit more body to it. That's not really where the juice of everything is. The next thing I did was to add some shimmer reverb. I've got this plugin here from Valhalla. Uh, it's called Valhalla Shimmer. And this really, I've been dying to use this plugin in a project since I got it. Um, this adds loads and loads and loads of shimmer reverb to it. In fact, I've, I've adjusted the mix so that all you can really hear is shimmer reverb. And um, let's have a listen to see how that sounds. Quite different. <laughs> Wow, that's massive, huh? In fact, let's just push that mix up even more. Okay, when you get the mix near on full, then the notes really kind of fade in rather than hearing the attack of the note at all. So um, that's a little bit too loud for that particular section. So let's just uh, take it out of solo mode and then just bring it right down here. So around about here and let's see how it listens or sounds in that section of the song I really like that a lot. And the other thing that I did was right at the beginning of the song, oh, I was just listening to the beginning of this song and I felt I just want something a little bit more ear catching right at the beginning before that acoustic guitar comes in. And the way I've approached this is to grab a few items from the rest of the song, uh, drag them down to the beginning of the song, including the cajon, the organ, and a bit of the acoustic guitar. And I've reversed the acoustic guitar so it sort of builds in and I've also added a little bit of this shimmer guitar in there as well. So um, sorry to throw this in at lot late in the day, but this sometimes happens. And just let's listen to the very beginning of the song now. Okay, so I've got a little bit of editing to do on that, which you're going to hear um, in the next episode, I guess, um, where I'm actually going to make sure that that ends very abruptly when that guitar comes in. So that's what I've been messing around with so late in this project, but I just felt that oh, once I heard those things in my head, they just had to be there. Thank you so much for watching this episode in the series. In the next episode, we will be improving our mix with automation. Now if you liked this video then you can show your appreciation by hitting the like button, it really does help me out. If you haven't done so already please subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you're notified about other episodes and content from this channel and I'll see you in the next video.